It is interesting because you think of golf clubs and you probably wouldn't think of this one. Apollo Bay was a very isolated town and its uh, starting point would have been the timber industry. There was pioneering families, I suppose, and yeah, working class people. People who lived down here, <laughs> they were, uh, yeah, they were, they'd have to be tough. You got impenetrable bush basically up in the Otways. The only, only way in was basically by ship. You had your group in the mill, you had the group out getting the timber, the logs, and probably had about 30 families, might have been more. In fact, one of our members, his grandfather, was a logger up near Jellybrand. So the history's just on our doorstep here in terms of timber. It was a bit of a task to get it to ports in Geelong and Melbourne in that there were no roads at that time. So most of the people that lived here were chopping timber down, floating it out to sea and taking it away because there was no roads in and out of a polar bay at the time. The ocean road wasn't there until after the First World War. I mean, the hills were so steep and slippery and the roads weren't good enough to get anywhere from here. People were very brave to come. I suppose there was opportunities. It was more like the new frontier. Well, it was a bit of a pioneering settlement in the sense that it was, um, was a port and it was a timber cutting town and it was sort of at the end of the track in some senses. So uh, it felt like it, uh, it had its own spirit and it was a sort of standalone attitude and, and atmosphere. I think the community spirit was very strong because they, it was hardship for everyone. Post the First World War, when uh, many people had been away and the whole country was trying to get itself back on its feet, I imagine going back to uh, the beginning of the golf club, uh, the town saw uh, clubs and uh, community facilities as a way of bringing people together and uh, naturally very self-resilient just because of where it was. You wouldn't have travelled as far back in those days, so you needed something to do within town. Back then it would have given them another group to, you know, get together and have social social functions and so forth. Golf course was probably one of those ones where people just thought it's on a point that was windswept and no one else wanted to live out there. So they go, what else are you going to use it for? Well, we'll graze cattle on it and hey, let's, let's have a golf course. A small group of people, four or five, six in number, came up with the uh, idea of starting uh, a golf club and forming a course. Some members sort of went to uh, the Powling family who had the Ballarat Hotel and mentioned about, you know, would they be able to use Point Bunbury to have a hit of golf? And from that, basically, you know, little things, big things grow. Point Bunbury would have been taken up and would have been in their sites at that time as it was designated for recreation purposes. So when the founding fathers of Apollo Bay looked at this particular piece of land, they would have seen enormous similarities between Scotland and Apollo Bay, and they would have said, this is an, an ideal place to put a golf course. And that opened up the, uh, the volunteer hours that went into construction of the course. Like everything with when things start out, it's you know, volunteers. Whether it be the original residents who got it all going, through right through to the you know, people who maintained the course in the early days, um, right up to the working bees we still have today. Would have been uh, local, or probably farmers, cart, anyone who was doing carting of any sort or had equipment of that sort to do it. All the grasses and turfs would have had to be brought in, levelling or raising and mounding of soils, sculpturing the course, if for want of a word, all hands to the pump, as it were, nibbling away. Yeah, a lot of it was just doing it themselves and then build it as it happened. There was nothing built here initially, but there was the importation of a shed from the rear of the Ballarat Hotel, the top pub. It was used there as their butchery or slaughterhouse. 
their sausage room where they used to make their own meat. <laughs> and that was our first clubhouse. I can imagine its footprint would only be a fifth of the size of the present club room. So it was added on to and added on to and added on to. We grew from there. So it was one of those community assets where they just, few people having belt and the ball uh, to becoming a, um, what we've got today where it's built by the community forum. Oh, they'd have felt exhilarated, I think. Would have been very proud of what they'd done and um, whether the course was a bit rough or not probably didn't matter at that stage. It probably was when it was first built, I imagine. They'd have had a, a smile from ear to ear, I think, just to think they'd put a huge amount of effort in and now they were going to start to reap some of the benefits. people who started it originally when they sort of thought, geez, we've actually got this up and running, how good's this? I think if you look into club history, you'll see they've got photos of the greens with the band of wire around the greens to keep the animals off as they played. And then when they had the competitions come, they just pull the, pull the wires down and use the green because they didn't want sheep chomping around the, the holes. It was a mutual help, wasn't it, in that uh, Mr Powling had his cattle fed, um, but the golf club had their lawns cut. And that, again, that's a bit I like about the community side of it. It was, it's not just a golf club, you know, as you say, the rifle butt, you know, they used to do shooting on the course. It used to have a rifle range there that, that over the weekends they were shooting out towards the sea. Would have made it very interesting to try and putt on those days. I uh, hope it wasn't a comp day. When the course was first started, you would have found a lot of the, the mill workers or the people that worked in the local shops and what have you. After work, we'll go and have a, have a hit and then we'll go back to the bar and yeah, you can buy your tea and have a drink here. <laughs> in that man is a social animal, we need our clubs and our associations. Golf is 80% social. You're all coming in together and you have a cup of tea or whatever and, and chit chat. And, yeah, that's good. I think it was George Bernard Shaw who said that golf was a good walk, spoiled. In Apollo Bay, uh, you're quite right, if your golf isn't very good, it's a good walk enhanced by the view. You can see the ocean from every hole. It's, it's good to go around with, with people that you know, uh, or even new people that you've met, you have a, a bit of a yarn about what's going on, the things that have happened in the past. The beauty of Apollo Bay is that it is open and it's always been open for everyone. You know, we've got kids on a Friday afternoon, we'll come and play. When I'm playing now, a lot of the men that I'm playing with are in their 80s. I mean, Donio's close to 90. They're still fit and healthy and they get around, but it's the banter that's talking about anything that's, you know, ongoing on around in town or just catching up with each other. So it gives that connection still when people are getting older. So they'd all come down here and you'd see them in groups of four just going around, <laughs> you know, enjoying the golf, but more they were just reconnecting with their friends. I enjoy a lot of the company with the women here and they're all of all ages and everybody gets along really well, which is great. I think that's the beauty of golf. Anybody can play, and the combination of old and young together, I think, is really good. You can all get along and have a go. The social interaction's the number one thing that the golf club brings. The golf just happens to be the vehicle to it. The camaraderie is paramount, and that continues back into the clubhouse after the game. 
like all the men go to the pub on a Friday night to relax after their week. It was more or less the same atmosphere. Everybody tear up here after work. Of a Friday night, this place would be full of people. Your builders and your, you know, all your businessmen, they were all one, that was totally the same, you know. Everyone was sort of equal thing, there was no noses in the air or, you know, it was great. I was going to the shore about past four, five o'clock and go over and we go and play nine hours of golf. We'll have a few beers, go and have play and it was a day's work. No, it didn't matter who, whether you were a storekeeper or a mechanic like myself, or, it was just the ordinary labourers, we were all, we were all part of the club. Traditionally, I think a lot of people saw golf as a, a rich person's sport. The private clubs were a bit elitist, they were. They had money, they spent money, and they liked to look like they spent money. Personally, I hate that stuck up feeling <laughs> about, you know, some of the, the posh golf clubs in Melbourne and what have you, you know, you've got to, to go inside the clubhouse, you have to have the tie and jacket on. It tends to drift out onto the course too can get a bit pompous at times and there's, certainly there's none of that here. It's more one of those ones where anyone can come and play. I think it was at Second World War where the families and wives of soldiers had free membership. Things like that, which is always through the club. A lot of people wouldn't be able to afford to play because sometimes you can pay up to $10,000 or more for your membership. So who's going to do that? Ours are you know, 365 or something like that, I think, which is like a dollar a day, if you want to put it that way. I think if you went to Royal Melbourne or Kingston Heath or somewhere with a, a T-shirt and a pair of daggy shorts, you wouldn't be welcome. I've played many a times in my um, hiking, walking boots. When I have gone somewhere else, they've sort of said, uh, this is not um, the, the Cradle Mountain circuit, mate. What are you doing? You'll see people come after work and they'll just play and they might have uh, hobnail boots on, you know, that sort of stuff. Three guys uh, rocked up to play golf. They were in singlets, shorts, thongs. One of them didn't have any footwear at all. And they played golf and had a great day. We don't worry about the fact that you, you don't have the regulation shorts or you don't have socks with your shoes or you don't have shoes at all. You get the guys out there in their singlet tops and their bare feet or their thongs. So what? They're out there having fun, having a game of golf. Whereas they couldn't go to a lot of the bigger clubs and be able to do that. Even today, like, you know, we have visitors come down and those sort of think, oh, you know, I'm not dressed properly, you know, I'm wearing a singlet, shorts and thongs, you know. And it, you know, I usually say, well, you're overdressed. But apart from that, you think, come on out. So we don't have that airs and graces that a lot of golf clubs have. You have just to play golf. There doesn't seem to be any class structure in here or out there. You're not affected by what you've got or what you're wearing or, or anything else. Nobody judges you on things like that. The only judgment is, is how good you're playing today. In the club's history, there's been, you know, world history as well. Things that have changed the dynamics 
the geography or the economics of the town, whether it be, you know, the two world wars, the Great Ocean Road, the harbour, and which has affected the town as well. Yeah, the building of the harbour here at Apollo Bay, it was ventured that it would provide uh, a safe haven for the local fishing fleet. The rocks being sourced relatively nearby, brought in by trucks across a way bridge opposite the Catholic Church up here. Between the fourth green and the fifth tearway, we had the road running through the golf course to cart the rock out of the big breakwater. You just dodge the trucks driving up and down. In the man upset Mother Nature, she kicked back and the harbour started to silt up with sand. On the north side of the harbour, the sand was accumulating and accumulating, progressed something like 150 metres. I suppose it changed a lot for the town because the actual geography of the town, you know, the foreshore appeared. You know, pretty much before then, the beach pretty much nearly went to the road. Back in those days, there was no course in front of the clubhouse. So the current first and second holes didn't exist before, 19, or before 1960, basically. I think one of the members, Donnie O'Meara, used to catch crayfish down here. I think it was Donnie O'Meara and uh, a few a few others, again, you know, volunteers, and they saw the opportunity to have a first hole. The sand had all done its job and built up there. They basically levelled it off threw some dirt down, bulldozed it, flattened it out, and away you go. New first and second. We've got a nine hole course at the moment because uh, this is the, the small parcel of land that we're on, which is not very big, and we can only just squeak nine holes into it. It's only going to be a nine hole course. No matter how much we water it, it's not going to grow into an 18 hole. When I first came in at 98 as the captain, we were having an issue then with getting the lease at the time extended. The clubs leases the land, so therefore you've got that uncertainty of how long you're going to be here. Back at the end of last century, that was the same case. They fought really hard and got a 21-year got a, uh, lease. We were told, at the end of your lease, that's it. There'll be no golf in Apollo Bay at all. And so our job was to find a place to build a course. The committee at that stage decided, well, we'll look for land. Yeah, the Apollo Bay Club, as I keep mentioning, is all run by volunteers. It's a not-for-profit organisation. So there'd be huge costs, in it. one, in the acquisition of the land, two, in constructing the course, and three, in establishing a clubhouse. And we all struggled. We donated trophies and anything to make money for the golf club, and we bought the land. We actually bought it. Uh, yeah, we bought the land off the Garrett's, off John and Dot Garrett. It was about a bit over 100 acres, I think and then deciding where were we going to get the money to lay a golf course out. Uh, we were be between a rock and a hard place. Then developers came and they wanted to build an 18 hole golf course. We were torn because we had our nine hole golf course here and we thought, you know, if a development goes ahead, it's 18 holes. We knew the costs uh, would increase. It, it caused a, a lot of angst in the, in the club as well, and I think they had meetings about it. And um, we worked for, for nearly 10 years trying to get that to come to fruition, and in the end the government put a stop on it because where we wanted to put the course, they wanted to build a dam. Farwin Water decided that they wanted about 25% of the land for a new water storage basin out in that area, and that 
eventually became oh, something nearer to 50%. And when that was knocked on the head, hang on, we've only got two or three years left to run, and so we had to fight again to get, get the lease renewed here. People were very, very anxious about the future of the golf club. Many of our members whose families are involved in the community, whose grandchildren are involved in the community, they were fearful that they would lose their place in this community. It, it caused them to think whether they could be part of the community going forward if there wasn't a golf course in Apollo Bay. The townspeople supported us to stay here because they liked this green space around the point. And we're very grateful that the other parties on the other side of the equation uh, saw the same vision that we did about community benefit, community resource, and the whole sense of community in Apollo Bay. It's not just a, a golf club for privileged people to play. You know, anyone can play it. I think that's held the club in good stead. I don't think Apollo Bay could have afforded to have a course that size. It would have gone beyond the financial capacity of a lot of people in the town, I think, to have a course like that. This is a terrific course because anyone can come and play it here. In fact, probably half the people that play here have never played golf in their life. We've got rental clubs that virtually cost you nothing to hire. For $25, you can play all day if you want to. So you just go round and round and round till, you, till you're giddy. Most of us, I think, probably breathe a sigh of relief in the finish when we no longer own that land. We were very grateful. The Otway Coast Committee, the Colac Otway Shire, they saw that the community needed this benefit uh, and they negotiated the lease. Oh gosh, all right. This is the only place we can have a course, so let's make it as good as we can possibly make it. A club is the people that are in it, each one is an individual. I think that's a lovely spirit to have in a club and that's, I believe that's here. Money doesn't come from nowhere. You always have to find some funds and even setting up a golf club as rustic as this one was. The club did a terrific job in, in raising funds even though the green fees were, were quite low. Historically, the, the golf club did lots and lots of different activities that they could use to fund just having a greenskeeper. And whereas once upon a time, people from town, maybe farmers, etc., would bring in their own equipment or gear, an all-in community activity to make sure they had a course for people to play and enjoy. We've got some really good workers amongst the women that put in quite a few hours, and a lot of the women have been the spearheads for running the green fee office over the summer. Marriott Depler played a big role. Dorothy Grasby, Ina Denny. They just had a natural way about them. I know when we're on committees and we'd be running a visitor's day, you'd have to give reasonably good trophies. Well, nearly everyone on the committee would donate a trophy. So as the money we made, all went into the club. Everything was voluntary. They used to have the workmen's club, as they called themselves, and they used to come out and work on the course. Oh, well, there's always been a dad's army or uh, work, working bees, which we try and have one probably once a month, painting the fence or spraying the fence lines, whipper snipping, keeping the gutters along here clean, just keeps the place looking as though it's a bit more loved. But as you say, they're the sort of people that you need. Yeah, you need someone to not only 
get the ball rolling, but actually push the ball in the first place. I know of people that do work on the clubhouse and also come and do cards and fill in cards and everything, and they're happy to go about their job. Don't want recognition for it, but keeps the golf club going, you know, without that, it can't happen. If you're gonna play, you might as well support it and give back. Well, I'm, I'm very proud of what I've done on the course, and you never got paid for it, but you don't enjoy just to play, a, play the game, you join to help the club out, and if you can help the club, why not? Once you retire, you need things to keep you busy, otherwise, you know, there's not much left for you. Yeah, you know, they come over here and they give me things to do and do your little bit to keep it going and help out, what it was all about. It's uh, another outlet that keeps you busy in your life as you get older as well. And the golf club gives people a purpose. Well, I think it's true of nations, it's certainly true of families, the common endeavours that are passed on from one generation to another. My grandfather, Dad's father, was one of the originals that helped set the course up. He only lived just across the road, so he was virtually the superintendent here. Mum started to play, and she started to play in her, say, 50s. And I said to her, if you want to be good at this, you need to take it up while you're young. So she took it up the following year. My mother played, I played, and my daughter played. So we had three generations playing golf. And we've played together quite a lot. Uh, and we've had quite a lot of enjoyment out of as a family. I suppose we've been lucky in the sense that the club's had a lot of long-term members, grandparents, parents, children and grandchildren and that still continues today. Gilly's one who's hung around, he's you know he's been a good golfer, junior golfer, he's been a club champion and he's done a lot of things in the club and he's tried to help foster interest among the juniors. When I first started golf I was out as a 13, 14 year old playing and then um, the old guys got me involved it was good for my development just as a person, but then I see now, you know, I still see myself as young compared to them, like I'm in my 50s, and yet then we have um, young Isaac Nozita, who's, you know, Donio's grandson, who's now a apprentice greenskeeper. This year, being his first year, he's been a school-based apprentice, and then uh, next year going on to be a full-time apprentice with us. And the good thing with that, having Isaac here is the connection, that connection with the past again, you know, Donny O'Meara being his grandfather, right through to, you know, his current day where he's a member himself. You can see the circle going through and, you know, my kids and Deary's kids will be out here in not too much longer. We're proud of our membership in the sense that we've got connections with parents and uh, and sons or daughters, um, and we've got to also um, elements of grandchildren. It makes you realise you're part of an ongoing harmonious community. And the responsibility of the club is to be part of the community, not just exist for itself. It is available to everybody. The golf club is about keeping community-based asset to the town. At the golf club, we're uh, very, very mindful that we are at the heart of the, the Great Ocean Road and are at the heart of the community of Apollo Bay. One example of that is the Recycle Water Project, which will mean that we can take uh, recycled water onto the golf course, and that will uh, relieve the burden from the community so that the 
potable water can be used for the community, not for the golf course. We have an excellent relationship with Gorkapa, and we can bridge the gap between Gorkapa and the community. It's a real privilege to take part in it. You think of the big a group of people from the beginning to make it the club that it is today is a wonderful thought. You know, how remarkable it is that people in a remote community with virtually no resources uh, say to themselves, we can visualise a golf course of this beauty that we have today. I think it's reflective of the, of the love the commitment, the contribution, and the collaboration amongst the community. It respects the fact that there are many people who've given hours and hours of volunteer work. We owe to their memory to keep the place uh, looking good, uh, but also I think we owe it to them to have a, um, a local community uh, nature. Would be awesome to think that it can go for another hundred, you know, with the people and the town who will fight for the club to stay here and fight for leases to be renewed, I think it can happen. Well, we are enormously privileged to stand on the shoulders of history and take over stewardship of the, of the golf course. This is history in the making. You just care it and then you pass it on to the next generation. So you just hope that the time that you get to nurture it and look after it that you do the best you can and then um, yeah we can give it to the next crew and they do the same.